this wire out of the way. There. Can we have the house lights up, please? Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Let's turn our Bibles there and see what the Scriptures have to say. <coughs> I heard a voice from heaven saying, Bright, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. What does that mean? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Are they blessed to go to the Hadean realm? Is that what he was saying? Are they blessed to skip that because it's been taken out of the way because there has been no place found for it and the new Jerusalem takes its place, this new covenant. We've seen that very clearly here tonight. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Let's answer that question. Let's answer that question. I also want to answer the question about the Lord's Supper. I love this. This is great. This is good stuff. The Lord's Supper. Why do, we, why do preterists Take the Lord's Supper. Well, let me ask you this question. Why do Christians take the Lord's Supper? Well, I'll tell you why. Maybe you haven't heard this in a while in your congregation. 1 Corinthians 11.26 says you do proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Now let's think about this. We get hung up on this word until, and we're going to get hung up on it just like we do whether we capitalize church or we put a little C on it. And boy, we'll just go to town over that. But let's, let's focus in on this. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. What did Paul say to Timothy? He told Timothy, he said, Timothy, until I come, give attention to public reading to, uh, of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Now notice what he said. Until I come. The exact same words. Now what did he mean there? Okay, Timothy, after I come, you don't have to study. You don't have to give exhortation. There's no more teaching and so forth. The point of it is this, if we do not partake of the Lord's Supper, if we're not remembering Him, have we forgotten the context that Brother Mark pointed out? Look at chapter 10, look at chapter 11. What is the context of the Lord's Supper? The whole point of it is this, verse 30, you die spiritually if you are not remembering His death, burial, and resurrection. We're commanded in verse 33 to do what? To wait on one another and partake with it of one, of one another. The Lord's Supper is taken. The same reason every other Christian in the world takes it. Hopefully you all understand what the Lord's Supper is for because we're not denying that at all. And we see that exactly the way that it ought to be. But something I think that he's done is try to put words in our mouth. You know... Build the straw man, tear it down. Build the straw man, tear it down. That's exactly what he's trying to do. I don't have time to answer all of these things, but I can answer some things that he wouldn't bring up about Hymenaeus and Philetus. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse uh, 16 uh, uh, and 18 there, I want you to turn over here and look at this because you need to mark this in your Bibles because this is where everybody goes. Well, you're just Hymenaeus and Philetus. Let's look at this. He says in verse... 17, their talk will spread like gangrene and among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Well, they're saying that the resurrection has already taken place. Their timing is way off. Well, we can make that argument. We can stand up here and do that. But let me point out something very critical that you may have never even thought about. Because you've had people tell you this, Never explain it to you. How could Hymenaeus and Philetus get away with this lie that Jesus warned about? Matthew chapter 24, I think it's about verse 30. He says there are going to be people who come and they, they, they're coming in my name. I'm warning you, don't listen to them. He's here, he's there, and so on. One critical point. How could they get away with it? Because everybody knew in the first century, that the resurrection was a spiritual resurrection. That's why they could go up to them lying and say, oh, it's already passed. You missed it. And they're going, wait a minute. Guess what? You know what they were saying in the first century? Well, the bodies are still in the tomb. <laughs> no, that's not what they were saying. That's not. They knew that it was a spiritual resurrection. Mark forgot to point that out. The graves were not empty. You know, there's something that a lot of people want, want to ask me about. They, they point this out. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. They say, well, every eye is going to see Him. So we go over there and we took it. We uh, take a look at Revelation chapter 7. But 
where does these, where do these phrases come from? So remember what we talked about. These were Jews. These were Hebrews. They were writing with words that they knew, things that they had been taught all their lives. They went to school. That was their education. It was their economy. It was everything to them. So this is how they spoke, just the way everything to us is how we speak. So they got this from Isaiah chapter 66. Notice here in verse 18. Isaiah 66, 18 says, I know their works and their thoughts. The time is, is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, it's a direct, direct quote. It gives the time. What was Zechariah 12? When the armies are surrounding Jerusalem. Who's going to see them? Look at verse 10. They who pierced Him. Who were those who pierced Him? It was the Jews. Paul blamed them. It wasn't the Romans. Acts chapter 2, I think verse 24 or so. He blamed them. He said, you are the ones who crucified Jesus. And they didn't. They didn't drive the nails. The sad fact that we see here tonight is that there are some who are trying to destroy our hope. Jesus said what He meant. Our hope is heaven. That C.S. Lewis quote that we had just a few moments ago. Heaven. You know what? He was confused about it. How many Christians have been confused about, about what, did he, what did He say this or did He say that? Colossians 1.27 Christ in you is the hope of glory. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12. Mark this one in your Bibles. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. If your hope is deferred for some undetermined amount of per, uh, period of time in the future, a couple million years, 200 million years, then your heart's going to grow sick. You're going to give up. But if you know things are certain and they're laid out the way that Jesus said they were laid out, we looked at those five passages, His own words, I'm coming in your lifetime. Some of you standing here will not taste death until you see me. How do we get around that? How do we get around that? Our hope, look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, starting here, verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord and Jesus Christ who ascending to... <coughs> <laughs> That's okay. We'll try it again. Do I get 30 extra seconds? Go ahead. You're fine. Okay. It has caused. Listen to this. This is our hope. Jesus Christ has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Where? Reserved for you in heaven. How do you get around it? We want people to tell us that Luke 16 is still in force today. It's because we haven't studied. Would to God that we would become those walking Bibles of yesteryear. We're not anymore. The Lord's church has given up. It has given up on study. It has given up on seeing it. You want to think that Max King, I've never read a stitch of Max King. I've seen these things, and over the years, you know, I started seeing these things, and it's like, well, it doesn't make sense, but I've got to go with what this commentary is telling me, and they bought me the Zur commentaries, so I've got to listen to that. And, and, but they told me I was too stupid to understand. They quoted me Titus chapter 3 and verse 9. Don't ask foolish questions. Well, these are the foolish questions that have got answered tonight. And I know that there's a great many people in here who will not accept this truth. But Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3 says, those who have understanding will shine brightly. If you have ears to hear, hear what your Savior said. The church of Christ is about restoring humanity and us, if we think that we're so good that we can't fall away, what about Josiah? For 300 years, they didn't worship correctly because the law was lost. 300 years. How did that happen to God's chosen people? Where they allowed prostitutes into, into the temple? How does that happen? The same way it can happen today. The same way. The sad fact of the matter is we're looking forward to our hope as being the resurrection in the future. You've seen one too many Michael Jackson thriller videos, folks. Because what we're doing is we're looking forward to our bodies coming up out of that grave, coming from Sheol, coming up out, going back to the dirt, coming up out of that for a split second to turn right back into the same thing that we were just a split second ago. It doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. Our hope is Jesus Christ. Our hope is being baptized and becoming added to the body of Christ. Nothing has changed. But you know what? We have changed. People have changed. We are not listening 
Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. When's the last time you sat down and studied your Bible and not just went to church? Preachers, what are we doing? We are responsible. Elders, what are we doing? We're responsible, Mark. We've got to show people what is right. And we've got to let them look. It's a shame that we discourage Bible study. Call me. Let's sit down and study. If I'm wrong, please, I beg you, help me see this. I don't want to be wrong. Thank you.